Well, let's get serious and get into this. Uh, keep in mind what these are for. You know, we've been married as long as uh, Don and I have, and many of you have been long and longer. You know, what, what am I going to say to you that's going to improve your marriage? I mean, you got to be looking at that. You learned how to overcome conflicts and, and all that other stuff. Uh, it's there, but we can always make improvements. So let me start reading verse 24 of Matthew chapter 7. Therefore, what, therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken unto him a wise man, which built his house upon a rock. Rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, because it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, uh, which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Now, one of the things that I want to remind you of, that I, I have four points that I'm dealing with, and two of them we've already covered. The commitment, the, uh, the companionship, the communication, and the control conflict. Those are the last two we're going to be on. I'm just going to kind of work my way into that to get to it the way that we need to get into it. Really what this message is about and what stimulated me to use these four points is because there's a lot of ways to try to improve marriage. You can, you can improve a marriage in 20% of the ways and it really won't improve your marriage. There are fundamentals in anything that is done, doesn't matter what it is, and especially in marriage. And if those fundamentals aren't right, 80% of them, if they're not right, then you're going to have problems in your life and in, your, and in the foundation of your marriage because you don't have the things that need to be in your marriage. You may stay together, good for you for that. But it's not going to be a happy marriage. And the goal of the Bible, the Bible gives us to have a marriage that's not only a good marriage, but it's a fun marriage. You know, one of the things that I uh, dealt with, and, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but it's all right to do that, is friendship. I want you to stop and think about that. Are you good friends with your spouse? Really good friends with your spouse? I'm not, not necessarily asking if you love them. I'm going to just give you that assumption and say that you do, but... Are they really and truly your best friend? Can you fight about anything? A lot of laughter in your home. A lot of fun in your home. Uh, those are really important things. That very first one is probably the most important of all, and that's why I started out with that, this matter of commitment and marriage. Because the world has changed things a lot. They really have. Uh, I can tell it with the people that I do, and I, you can tell it too. I don't have to convince you of this, but... You look at the world today, and they approach marriage by saying that they're going to stay in marriage as long as they're in love. And if they ever fall out of love, then they're going to get out of the marriage. And that the world is buying that, but that's not what the Lord said. The Lord said it's not for as long as you both shall love, it's for as long as you both shall live. That's well, why I said to you a moment ago, even if you've been married a lot of years and you're not all that happy, God bless you for staying together. You know, I'm, I'm convinced that my mom stayed with my dad for 25 years, uh, I'm sure the initial years weren't like that, but for all the years that it was like that, for the kids' sake. Bless her heart that she did that. She felt it was better to put up with a lousy marriage, because that's what she had, was a lousy marriage. And she did that for our sake. And I'm going to tell you, probably for everybody else in my family, that's a bad decision for her to do that, because he was mean to everybody else in the family. Really mean to him. But he, wasn't, he never was mean to me. My little sister helped me out with that. She said, when I came along, and in our house, uh, we had um, um, uh, we had kids that were there. We had eight kids all together. I, I, the reason I'm hesitating, I'm thinking the one that was born before me a couple of years, and he lived a number of months. I think they named him Jack, and he died. And uh, so because of that, we had a boy that was born, which was my brother Ralph, who was 13 years older than me, and then three girls. And then I was born, and then three more girls. And for some reason, in the middle of all that, Shirley says that I was just the apple of my dad's eye. Uh, he had already had a terrible relationship with my brother Ralph because he was always defending everybody in the family. And with, I mean, with me, I never knew anything about all that. I had some, some vague memories of some bad things, but that's, that's how it was. You want more than that. You want more than just staying together, being together. You want more than a wife saying, okay, I forgive you, or a husband saying, okay, I forgive you. But then there you are, you might as well be separate because you never talk to each other. Have you ever been to a restaurant and you see a husband and wife, or at least it appears that it's a husband and wife are sitting there, and not a word is spoken? They're just eating. Now, for guys, that may not be such a bad thing, but it's a bad sign when a woman's like that. I can tell you that right now. We'll get into some of that when we get into communication. You've got to work on the right things and the non-negotiable things. 
Uh, these four things that I'm bringing to your attention, a lot of thought that I put in it, and of course in, in reading other messages on the home, because I have lots of messages on the home, uh, reading not only my own, but many other messages in preparation for this one. I've been preparing this message for months. And, and I boiled it down to these four things that are extremely important. So this matter of commitment is by far the most important. I just said to you this matter of staying together as long as you're in love or staying together as long as you live. What does the Bible teach? Let's look at Matthew chapter 19. Go to that slide for it. I know you see that. And then we're going to go to 5 and 6, I think. I got this messed up, don't I? You'll know where I'm at, though. This is really important. Um, there's a lot of different beliefs when it comes to preachers uh, concerning this matter of marriage and divorce and remarriage. Um, I know what I believe about it, but I'm not going to push that very hard on a whole lot of other people. I've got good friends that we agree in every single area, but we don't agree in that area. You got some people that believe that, that if you marry someone, there's no reason that God gets for divorce. Not ever. Not under any circumstances. Then you got those who say, well, we believe that there that's true, but there are two exceptions to that. It's called the exception clause. Two exceptions to that. One is desertion, and the other is sexual unfaithfulness. Those are two reasons that God gives for divorce. And then there are those who believe in divorce for any reason at all. It's not all that different from back in Christ's day. Because you had those same, very same liberals. That a wife didn't matter too much what she did if you just didn't like the way she looked at a certain age. Well, then you got a divorce. Now it's okay. They thought it was okay. But most of them didn't believe that. Most of them believed that there were reasons why a divorce could be had. Now let's read this in Matthew chapter 19. Um, I don't know how many of you still have Criswell Study Bibles. It's a believer's Bible also. But excellent, excellent notes there. He does a superb job in breaking this down and showing us the various beliefs, the lines that I do with premarital counseling, they have to come out of that understanding why they believe what they believe about marriage and divorce and remarriage. Because times are going to be tough. They always are. Are you going to stay married or are you not going to stay married? It's going to be based on your conviction. Here it is, beginning verse 5, Matthew 19. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. They too shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more two, but one. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now, that's pretty dogmatic. And the Lord, that was the Lord Jesus himself that is speaking there to bring this to our attention and make us understand it. That we need to understand when we get married, it's for life. At least when you're standing before a preacher or justice of peace or whatever it is, it's for life. You know, I can tell you, my mom never did talk to me about this stuff. I remember the only thing that ever even comes to my mind when we moved to Winton Terrace in Cincinnati after they had divorced, we had lived in North Avenue, which was a pretty nice community, and our whole world, world fell apart. We no longer had my dad's, um, no longer had his income coming in. My mother worked at Clopay, and I get the feeling she didn't have much of a job there in terms of money. And so it was, it was a difficult thing. And I can remember uh, Ethel, it was, some sister who's four years older than me, laughing at my mom and kidding her. She said, you know, we've got a neighbor over there across the road from us and really thinks you're good looking. And my mom, oh, my mom would get upset at her. She would really get upset at her. She said, don't you talk like that to me now. I don't hear anything more about men in my life. You know, she never explained that to me, but I'll, I'll tell you what I think it was. My mom had been married and divorced, and she believed that there's no, no reason you could ever marry anybody else. She is what I call a one-woman man, one-man woman. And, and you want to have a husband the same way, one woman and a man. Three causes that I gave you a divorce, and I keep driving this in because this is the number one thing. You already know what they are. Joe will have them up there on the screen. Selfishness is the number one reason for divorce. The number two reason for divorce is selfishness. The number three reason for divorce is selfishness. Look, if you're going into a marriage as a selfish individual, it ain't going to work. i got a lot of illustrations that I can give you about that. But you can't have selfishness there. If it's there, that means everything's centered on you. You're going to have great difficulties throughout your marriage. You've got to put the other person first. That's the bottom line of what it's got to be. Now, Joe, put that uh, triangle on it that's up here, too. This, I'm putting these up because these are the crux of this message. And you know what this is? The triangle that I use. The top is God, husband and wife on uh, either side, and the triangle stands for marriage. 
Common sense will show you that the closer you get to God, the husband gets closer to God, the wife gets closer to God, they get closer to each other. Now, when I saw that, and I don't really remember where I got it, but when I saw that, I thought, man, that's it. That's it. Because the bottom line of all of this is we get closer to God. And the closer we get to God, the closer we're going to get to each other. And, and, and I really want to drive that home. Some of you are having problems, and you may very well be. Uh, usually by the time people get to me, it's pretty late. Uh, most of the time, uh, they've already got their minds made up what they're going to do. I say most of the time. That's not always true, but most of the time that is true. But you can, you can calculate this yourself. I, I'd like you to think in these terms right now when you're looking at that triangle. As a wife, on the left-hand side, as a wife, where would you put yourself on that triangle? We know God's at the top. We know that represents marriage. Forget about the husband side of it. Are you way up there close to God? Or are you about halfway up? Or God forbid, are you all the way down at the bottom or somewhere in between? Because that means if things aren't right with God, they can't be right in your marriage. They can't. They can't be right in your marriage. Uh, the, the entire institution of marriage is based upon God himself and the commands that he's given. He instituted it. And then you've got the same thing with a husband. As a husband, how would you gauge where you're at? Let's, let's begin thinking in these terms, some pretty explicit terms that I want you to begin thinking in. Is the only one that's on your mind your wife or your husband? Or do you have a friend in your life that you think, well, I, I, wish, I wish my wife was more like her. I wish my husband was more like him. Because if you've got thoughts like that, you're in trouble. You're in big trouble. There shouldn't be anybody, there shouldn't be anybody in this world, forget about age, forget about beauty, forget about anything like that. There shouldn't be anybody in this world that you'd rather be with than the one you've committed yourself to long ago. That individual is there. Your wife. No one else. Now, that's also a thermometer for us because if you're thinking in that way, uh, that girl is it's not so much she's good looking, that girl is just really understanding. I remember years ago, a long time ago, in fact, I know this guy pretty well. And I remember uh, I was the associate pastor at Grace Baptist Church at the time, and I remember this guy came to me, just tore up, and it was right when a lot of people were there. Came to me and said, I really need to talk to you. Now, I wasn't used to that back in those days. I was the associate pastor. People would come to me, they came to the pastor most of the time. He came to me. And I said, well, let's, let's go downstairs where nobody else is at. We had another building and we had a basement in it. He really wanted a lot of privacy, so we went there. And all the way down there, I'm praying. I mean, I'm saying, Lord, I'm with the right answer to help him. I see he's tore up. Didn't know what it was. Called his wife out by name and he said, She's going to leave me. I said, Really? Why is she going to leave you? He said, It's another man. I said, No way. I mean, I, I didn't know about this lady, but I, I would have never thought that. I said, No way. I can't believe that's true. He said, well, I probably ought to clarify this. I said, she hasn't had a physical affair. But she goes out to eat with this guy all the time, and they're having lots of talks, and she says to me, I wish you could be like him. You know, they're still together today. That's a, that's a negative sign. Now, thank God, as far as I know, she had the sense to stop that. But they didn't go out and eat anymore. And, and as far as I know, because they still are the other day, and I know this couple, they seem very happy today. Apparently, they got things worked out. They didn't need my help getting them. But I, I want to tell you, wherever you've been, whatever battles you have gone through as a husband and as a wife, it's worth, it's worth really evaluating your marriage and doing what I just said. Where are you on that triangle, up or down? What would it take to get you all the way up, close to God, and as close to your wife, or as close to your husband as you can be? Send her to Florida for a week. Let her uh, stay with her sisters for a week. Listen, when, when she comes back, I just, I don't mind telling you. Uh, I, it's not enough just to say, hi, honey. And I always kiss her when I see her at the airport. I want to get alone where I can put my arms around her and just hold her. Don't. I just want to hold her. That's what I do. And, and that's imperative to me because that, that is, that's pulling her close to me. I've missed her so much. That is just so satisfying to me to know that that's there like that. Well, I'm saying to you, it's, it's got to be the same way. I, and I hope that you're not using it as a defense mechanism. Well, you know what? I'm just not like 
that. I mean, Donna, if you want to be that way yourself, that's just fine. Or you want to hug your wife and do all that. Listen, I'm going to get into something later. And in fact, I'm just going to say it to you right now because it won't hurt to repeat this over and over again. But there's uh, some things that men and women both have needs in their life. And one of the greatest needs that you're going to find that is in a woman's life is that a woman wants to be held. She wants to be held. They might say, uh, you don't know what my wife is like. Well, I don't have to know what your wife is like. I know that that's in women. It's in men too. I know I, I have that need that's in my own life. When I see my, when I see my son, I say that to the away. It's not enough for me to shake his hand, which I do. I've got to hug him. And it's pretty hard to get my arms around him these days when you consider me and consider him. We've got our arms somewhere on the side there like that. But I, I, do, I do that. And I've shared this with you before. There's times when Scott will, and he did this not real long ago, when Scott will just uh, hold me, puts his arms around me, and won't let me go. And I don't always know what that's about, but he doesn't need to explain it to me. I'm his dad. He can hug me all at once. But he holds me. Because, and it's his way of saying, Dad, I really miss him. He says it. He's not afraid to say it. And I do the same with him. Uh, with Rob, it's the same way. I, it's not enough for me to just see her and say, Hi, Rob, how are you doing? Now, I, I need to be able to hold her. Now, those are important things, and I really want you to get some consideration. You know, I'm not just doing these things because now I've, got a, I've done my duty. You know, here we are in February, Valentine's Day is in February, and we focus on the home, and I've done my duty. I brought some decent messages on the home, so now let's move on with the other things. That's not what I'm after at all. I know we've got strong homes in, in our church. But I also know we have some, some homes in our church that are pretty weak. I know that. I know that there are recovering homes that are in our church. And if I preach these messages just for them, it's worth it. And, and I'll tell you something that I learned a long time ago. Those of you that I know, and there's a lot of you, that have strong, strong homes, you rejoice in this. You're really glad that I preach this stuff. You're really glad because you, some of you may be aware of them, you may not be aware but you, you really want to see the kind of a marriage in others' lives that you've got yourself. Well, that's a good thing. Now, we looked at companionship also. And one of the points that I made with you is that marriage is uh, not just about falling in love with each other. Listen to this. It's about liking each other. And once again, let's, let's just uh, make application and absorb this. Do you like your spouse? I had, I had uh, one couple that I was dealing with and, and dealt with them separately. I had to for various reasons. And I, one of the first questions I said, I said, how do you feel about so-and-so? And, -so? and this, uh, this wife looked at me and said, my husband's very arrogant. Why don't you think about that yourself? How would you describe your husband? And as a husband, how would you describe your wife? Now think about that. Because if it's negative, we're talking about liking each other. When I look around the time, I like everybody in this church. I, I, I want to tell you, the, the other week when I was preaching to you about the church, and, and I was saying this to you, I, that was just in public, but in private, I, I, it was really getting to me. When you get where I'm at in life, you know, I mean, I, I'm just leveling with you honestly. I've confided in some of you. Uh, if I haven't confided in you, don't take uh, offense to that. I'm just, trying, I'm just trying to know what to do. I'm trying to follow God's will for my life. If God told me to step down tomorrow, I step down tomorrow. And if, and if that's what He wanted from me, praise God. That's exactly what should be done. You can't improve on God's will. And sometimes all that gets very confusing to me exactly what I need to do. And so I seek counsel. The Bible says there's wisdom in the counsel of many. I seek counsel to see what they think I, I need to do. What is your own personal opinion? Doesn't mean I'm going to do it, but I, I do want their opinion. Their opinion matters to me. And your opinion as a church matters to me. And when I begin thinking about those things, I get emotional about it. I, I don't care how long I live. If I step down tomorrow and if I live to be 100 years old, when I think about Bible Baptist Church, and that's you as a people, I'm going to well up. I can guarantee you, I'm going to well up. My, my love for you is, is just great in my own heart and mind. And, 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 and this is always in any church. Every pastor has it. You have it as a member of this church. There are members of this church that you love more than you do others, that you like more than you do others. But it doesn't change the fact that you love each and every one. And I feel that uh, very strongly and very deeply within my own heart. And so this is a matter of liking each other. You know, see, this is going to carry across. 
If as a husband and wife you don't like each other, how in a church when you have people like that, does a church don't like each other? Look around you. Is there anybody you don't like in this church? Well, shame on you. You ought to be improving that. And, and especially if you don't like somebody that you really do need to like. And it's really everybody, I know, but I'm thinking in more detailed terms than that. And so your spouse needs to be your best friend. As a matter of fact, in a national survey of 10 factors of marital success, uh, they, they looked at these people. What made their marriages work? And here were the first two things that they found out, these factors. My spouse is my best friend. That was number one. Number two is I like my spouse as a person. Now, those are important things. We've got to have the like factor that's in there. I pointed out to you some, some other things too. I pointed out to you that there needs, there needs to be in every husband and wife relationship confidence. You believe in each other. I had to back off of this uh, in a lot of areas. Donna has backed me when I don't know why she did it. I really don't. Um, but she had confidence in me. Throughout my life, Donna has given me counsel, pep talks, call them whatever you want. And get me back in touch with reality. She's very good at doing that for me. Donna won't lie to me. Donna sometimes has to say things to me that are pretty tough to take. But she does it. I'm grateful she does it. But Donna always keeps things pretty much in a positive light. And then you've got to be able to count on each other also. I put this in bright yellow because this is this really identifies this for me. When a friend walks in, when a friend walks in, a friend walks in when others walk out. A friend walks in when others walk out. Most of you will know who I'm talking about when I say this. Um, and some of you have had very similar situations. One of my best friends um, had to go to prison for two and a half years. And we stayed in contact on a very regular basis. And he cried out during those two and a half years that he was innocent of what he was accused of, and he had reasons why... Um, he felt like he was innocent. Somebody said to me, you can't really believe that he's innocent. And I said, I don't even occupy my mind with that. His innocence or his guilt is not, that's not what my friendship with him is contingent upon. If he's guilty, I'm still going to be his friend. And if he's not guilty, I'm still going to be his friend. Um, his wife stood by him the entire time that he was in prison. What did she believe? I don't have any idea. I never really talked to her about it. But I'll, I'll guarantee you, I know her. And I know that her thinking would have been exactly the same as mine. If he's guilty, I'm still standing by him. If he's not guilty, I'm still standing by him. Now think about that. We're talking about husbands and wives. If you had a husband or wife that went to prison, would you stand by him? We're, we're really trying to search out this friendship matter and the commitment matter that we have and how it's really going to be in our life. I touched on children and companionship. And I shared with you that this, your, your relationship with your wife has got to be the most important because children, God designed our relationship with them to remain, but they don't remain home. I, I've given them funny things about this. It was funny to me and Donna when Robin was uh, dating Gary and, and we would always tell her you can't get married until you're 30 years old. And finally we started saying, you know, we're just kidding when we say that. We don't really mean 30 years old. Um, and so, you know, you just, but you got to remember, kids are going to go their way. They are going to go their way. And so... It's very important we have an understanding of that stuff, too. The divine order is God, marriage, and children. And then um, laughter in the home. I can't emphasize this enough. You've got to have a lot of laughter in the home. It's one of the things I love about my home, that I love about Robin's home, and that I love about Scott's home. There's a lot of laughter that goes on. A lot of laughter. And I love you up to Scott's because as soon as we get there, he's got those five kids, and they're immediately starting to pick on me. They're immediately trying to pull me out Get me to do the things that make them laugh. And it's laughter from the beginning until the end. That kind of goes along with this, where we're going to pick this up at, and that is communication. Communication. Somebody said this, communication is simply talking in a way that the other person understands. Now, that's really important. Talking in a way that the other, per other person understands. Giving understanding to each other. Someone also said this, that you'll always love the one who understands you. Now, apply it once again. Do you understand your husband as he is? And do you understand your wife as she is? Stop and think about that. Men and women are different. 
Very, very different. And that, that, here's what somebody said. That possibility of misunderstanding is greater than the possibility of understanding. That's a little bit confusing. So let me say it again. Men and women are so different that the possibility of misunderstanding is greater than the possibility of understanding. Would you, would you agree with that? You would? Um, she can be saying, uh, I could yell up to her and say, Robin called. Robin fell? No, Robin called. What, did she hurt herself? <laughs> we have lots of conversations around our house like this, but let me tell you something. The funny thing is, not so funny, really, when you stop thinking about it, you got to be on the same page. you got to be on the same page when it comes to doing these things and communicating with each other. Here's the complaints. The number one complaint of women against men, they don't talk. When they communicate, they grunt. They make noises, but they won't talk. Now stop thinking about that. I don't want to identify anybody, but there's some people that are very difficult to understand on the phone. Maybe I'm hard for you to understand on the phone. But some people get lazy in their talk, and they just kind of run their words together, and you, I can't make out heads or tails what they're going to say. Uh, so sometimes husbands and wives are like that. They're grunting. They're not carrying on the way they need to carry on. Somebody said that the average woman speaks 24, or the average man speaks 24,000 words a day, and the average woman speaks 50 to 60,000 or more. Now, I'm pulling that out of, out of the, just out of the air, because that's all relative. That's all very relative. I, I, Gary, I understand. I, you have my... Nothing against you. I, I, one of the great delights of you guys coming to my church is getting to know Gertha. I've just come to love Gertha. I don't care if you speak uh, 500,000 words a day. Is that you do that? <laughs> They do. They talk more than we do. Just as I told you on Sunday, Donna's, she wants details. She has to have details. I sat with well, we my neighbor with Robin last night and Kylie, and, and I was in the back seat, and Robin's, was I in the back seat? Anyway, I'll, where was I? I didn't mean there's, I'm, you two were in the back seat. That's what it was. And I'm listening to them talk and watching in the rearview mirror, detail after detail after detail after detail. And they love it. They love the details. Me, just give me the highlights. That's all I want. I don't want the details. And most men are pretty much that way. All right. There's something about the way women talk, too. I love this. I want you to listen to this. I've got this in bright yellow. That means it really made an impact on me. I hope it does you. Listen to this. Listening to a woman talk is like ordering pizza one pepperoni at a time. I relate with that. There's another way of saying this. Uh, it's not just that women have to talk. They've got to get into the details. They've got to have the details. I, I know you're just like I am. You're thinking, look, I, I don't need the details. Just tell me. Who won the game or who lost the game? Don't tell me every single play in between. All I want to know is that you had pizza for supper. Don't tell me all the ingredients that were on the pizza. It's the difference between men and women. Now, three magic words that every man needs to learn. If there's communication problems in your home, especially... <laughs> Three major words. I'm not sure that I've ever said these words to you, but I, I do it in other ways. Anybody know what they are? Wrong communication. Just remember that. That's a good guess, because that's what I would have thought. The guy I was reading after, listen to what he said. Tell her, tell me more. I've never done that, I don't think. Do you ever remember me doing that? But I'll tell you what I do. I ask questions. I learned a long time ago that if I want to be able to communicate with my wife and satisfy her, I can't just let her talk and tell me what's happened. I've got to ask questions. Now, let's get away from the funniness of all of this because this is very important. What does that show my wife when I look her dead in the eye, as, as we have done since she's been back home? And she wants to know what's been going on. She wants to be brought up on everything. Everything. She wants to know Sam and Judy. Are they still married? And is everything okay? And I, just kids saying, you know, I picked out somebody that I knew was great. Um, she wants to know all the details about everything. And when she wants to know all those details, I'll ask questions. I'll, I'll, I'll let her ask anything she wants of me. And I, I'm, trying to stay, I'm trying to stay constantly tuned in. I'm not thinking about what I'm going to say when she's done talking. I'm not thinking in the back of my mind, I wonder if Kentucky won or lost. I'm looking her dead in the eye and I'm listening to what she has to say. 
Here it is. Listen to this. Every wife wants to be hugged, held, and heard. Without exception. Every wife wants to be hugged, held, and heard. Everyone. You know what? I discovered myself. And I know there's differences. But we men and you women really aren't all that different. We're not. The fundamentals in our life are these things. I want you to really get some thought to this. Everybody wants to be known. I don't care who you are. You don't want to feel like you're obscure back here in the corner. Nobody knows who you are. And furthermore, nobody cares who you are. Everybody wants to be known. Both husband and wife want to be loved. And needed express. We want to be accepted as we are. And we want to be valued and understood. Now listen, there are no exceptions to that. Those four things that I just gave you are fundamentals in every person's life, and that especially applies to married life. And I'm going to carry it just one step further. It isn't just that we want to be known by everybody. We especially want to be known by certain people. I want my wife to know me, to understand me, and vice versa. Now, the last thing, conflict control. You need to look at this verse. It's a powerful verse. It says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. And if you're going to do that, it's going to require some things for you. And, and I'm just talking from personal experience. That's the hardest thing in the world for me to do with her. To say, I was wrong. Uh, forgive me for talking in that tone of voice that I talked to you. Forgive me for walking out on you. Um, whatever the problem may be. And that's hard for me to do, but I do it. I think Don would tell you. You can talk to her afterwards when I'm not present. And you can say to her, is, is he pretty good at that? Because I am pretty good at that. It's taken a lot of years for me to do that. I have been a person in the past in my life where if I was wrong, too bad. I wasn't going to say I'm sorry that I was wrong. Now listen, there's people like that in the world. Those are bad people. And I was one of them. Where it's not just with your wife, it's just in life. If somebody crosses you, buddy, that's it. You write them off. That's what a terrible, terrible attitude to have in life. And the reason for it is because you're going to be hurt. This is no way around. It's going to happen. And so conflict... You gotta stop conflicts and how do you do it? I'm sorry. Honey, I'm sorry. I was wrong. I was being insensitive. I was being inconsiderate. Now listen to this, I'm just about done. This is this has got everything that I can put to call this to my attention. Because when you're up here preaching, I'm glancing down. Sometimes I'm glancing down more than others. But I put some of these things in such bold print and highlight them so greatly that I cannot forget to give you this. Listen to this. A lasting marriage involves inexhaustible forgiveness. Inexhaustible forgiveness. All right? Maybe your husband's heard all of this. I'm sorry, I was wrong. I was insensitive. I was inconsiderate. Too bad. He ain't going to say it to you. Are you willing to forgive him? He may never say it. You still willing to forgive him? And there's the other side of that, too. Whatever the bugs are that are in your marriage, are you willing to forgive? You know, my mind's wandering a little bit here. Sometimes forgiveness is easy to give. Sometimes the violation has been so deep and so hurtful it becomes very hard to forgive and you begin to wrestle with that. Listen, I've preached on forgiveness many, many times. This is imperative. It is imperative in life and especially in the home. Not just with a husband and wife, with kids. Listen, I've said it over and over again to you. The person that has the greatest capacity to hurt you is the person that you love the most. Think of that. You don't love somebody, it's pretty hard for them to really hurt you. Oh, big deal if they said that. No big deal. 
But when a wife says it, when a husband says it, and it's cutting, that hurts. That hurts. All right, last thing. Several hundred years ago, Martin Luther described a godly and a good marriage this way. Let the wife make the husband glad to come home. And let him make her sorry to see him leave. Very practical. Now let's just settle our hearts. Only God knows what he has applied to your heart right now. And maybe you're not quite certain where to go with this or what to do. It's very personal, very private. This is between you and your wife. And if this did not apply to you and your wife, if you're in a different situation, whoever that other person is that's in your life, that that needs to be put in there. You need to be thinking in those terms. But you need, you need to give it to God. You need to give it to God. You need to be willing to do anything that God asks you to do. I, I, you know, that's fine with me if you want to come forward. That's okay. That's not really what I'm after. I, I would far rather, not right here in the service, but I would far rather see a husband go to his wife in private when nobody else is around, no one to see, and get things straightened out. I'm here. If, if you want to be involved, I'll, I'll hesitantly get involved as far as to let me, as far as I believe I need to go. Let's I'm going to lead in prayer, but your prayer to God is really important right here. You already know what God has touched you with and what he hasn't. All of this didn't apply to you. Some of it did. Come on now, it's important that you're letting God communicate with you. What's he say? You need to identify that. What is your God saying to you right now about this? Second question is, what is he requiring you to do as a result of speaking to you. Because nothing else will do. Nothing else will do. Father, we confess to you that we are a sinful people. That's not news to you. That's why you say this by grace, because we just don't even have the capacity to save ourselves. As hard as we may try, we can't live a life that's good enough. That carries over in relationships in life, too. Not just with you. Father, we want to grow so close to you that sin is so ugly to us we just don't want any part in our life. I know, Lord, that ultimately that's not going to be until we're with you and have glorified bodies. But we can sure have the desire in our heart because you live inside of us. And you've given us commands. Be holy because I'm holy. And we really do want that. As far as we struggle, Lord, we really want that. And you, you see into our heart. You know what's really there. But we need the application of your Holy Spirit in each and every home of this church. I know that you've spoken to husbands right here tonight. And some who will listen to this message over the, the Internet. I pray, Father, that what you speak to them about, they'll be willing to do what you're telling them to do. I pray you restore to every marriage the trust factors that need to be there, the forgiveness that needs to be there, and the love and the liking and the laughter. I pray that it will be in all of our homes. And many of those homes that make up by far and away the vast majority of this church, strong homes, where this is old stuff to them, Lord, they really already like each other as a husband and wife. They've gone through the knocks and the hardships of life and it's only served to grow closer together. More in love than ever before. Well, Father, use the marriages of this church to strengthen the weak ones. To reach out to the people that are in need. Because you're God. And you find great delight in relationships that work and are thriving. You use for your honor and glory. We pray that you will do that and that you will bless this night and the remainder of this service because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.